what the heck is an RF laser? Isn't this just a CO2 laser? The answer to those questions is coming up. If you're watching this video, you've probably seen other videos on traditional CO2 lasers before. This one is a little bit different. This is the Thunderbolt RF laser. And what's under the hood of this thing makes it a very interesting laser. More importantly, what's not under the hood may be the reason you'll want one for your shop. The benefits of this machine are the reason I partnered with Thunder to review this laser. Looking into CO2 laser machines, you'll find that they come with either a glass or a metal laser tube. And the choice between the two significantly impacts the future maintenance and repair costs. Glass tubes powered by direct current or DC are great for engraving non-metal materials like acrylic and wood, but they have a larger beam diameter and slower engraving speeds. On the other hand, metal tubes use radio frequency or RF to excite the gas, allowing for finer detailing and higher pulse rates, which translates into better precision. When it comes to durability, metal tubes outperform glass ones lasting up to six years with proper care compared to a six to 12 month warranty typically offered for glass tubes. Budget wise, glass tubes are initially more affordable, but don't be fooled. Metal tubes, despite their higher replacement costs, are more economical in the long term due to their longevity. This Thunderbolt is the first in a lineup of bolt machines which use a radio frequency metal tube like I mentioned. There are three other machines in the series, each with additional bells and whistles, along with increased size and output. I'll get more into the accessories and capabilities in this video, but let me finish talking about the benefits of an RF laser. I mentioned there's some things under the hood that make this totally different from any of the other lasers you may be used to. If you look at traditional glass tubes in a CO2 laser, you'll notice that they require distilled water to be pumped around the tube to keep it cool. This is because the glass doesn't conduct thermal energy well. An RF laser does get hot quickly due to high pulse jobs, but the laser can be cooled with this bank of fans. So you don't need to maintain a separate water chiller or bucket of water to keep the laser cool. I've owned several glass tube CO2 lasers, and while a water chiller is a much better option than using a bucket and ice packs to keep the glass tube cool, not having to do either of those is a thousand times better. It was kind of strange when I was setting up this machine because I found myself looking for the water inlet and the outlet just kind of out of habit. Since a lot of people ask in other videos, and in case you're wondering, this laser uses standard 110 electrical outlet, and it does not require the 220 volt outlet. You also don't need a super powerful computer to run it, and those limitations are really a result of the software needed. There are two types of software options for getting your designs into the laser. You can use the included RD Works or purchase Lightburn. Honestly, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know that I'm a big fan of Lightburn, so that's what I'll be using for this machine and in this video. You'll see three different ports on the right side of the machine. The first is a USB connection to your PC, which is also necessary for one of the cool features that I'll talk about in a minute. There is the optional Ethernet cable. I'm not using this right now because I'm connected to the PC port. And the bottom one is a twist lock power cable. On the top of the machine, you'll see an indicator light, which will tell you if the laser is ready or active. Then on the right side, you have a place to insert your key. The laser won't operate without a key. And you also have an emergency shutoff in case things go south on you. This emergency shutoff will need to be in the upright position to operate the laser. So just give it a little bit of a twist and it will pop right up. Let's talk about the precision of the machine. Whether you're working on etching or engraving with this laser, getting the details just right is really important. The accuracy of the laser's work depends on how often it pulses. The more pulses, the more detailed the engraving. Imagine the laser heating up and then quickly letting go of that heat. This doesn't happen the entire time, but in quick bursts. This is different from a continuous flow of energy, which doesn't allow for these quick bursts. That's why lasers with glass tubes, which use continuous flow, can't pulse as rapidly and don't give you engravings that are fine as those lasers with metal tubes, which can pulse more quickly. 
So if you want really high quality engravings, a metal tube is a great option. The laser beam travels through a series of mirrors from the back of the machine to the front of the laser head. There is a beam combiner near the mirror that places a red dot along the laser path so you can easily see where the laser beam will travel. After it hits this last mirror, the laser beam passes through the lens, which will focus the laser beam, and then you have a few options of lenses for this laser. The standard lens for this machine is one and a half inches, but you can get the optional two inch, two and a half inch, or four inch lenses. The choice of lens affects the spot size with the two and a half inch lens having a larger spot size, which helps to reduce heat concentration and material warping during engraving without affecting the precision. The one and a half inch lens is designed for high resolution engraving up to 2000 DPI. Increasing to the two inch lens, which is a more universal focal lens for CO2 lasers, changes that DPI setting to around 1000 but it will allow you to cut up to 3 8 inch material. To cut thicker materials, you'll want to use the 2.5 or 4 inch lenses. If you'd like to see some tests on the functionality of these lenses in another video, let me know in the comments. This machine does have the autofocus capability, which is super nice, and the touchscreen interface used to autofocus is very user friendly. You almost don't need any laser experience to navigate around the settings of this Ruida controller. And I'll talk a little bit more about the touch screen in a bit. Before I cover the power of this machine, I wanna talk about the speed because it directly ties to the precision and lens choice that I just mentioned. The advertised engraving speeds of this machine are a thousand millimeters per second, which is super fast. This video isn't a direct comparison to any particular machine, but make sure that you're subscribed because I will be doing a comparison video very soon. But if you compare the engraving speeds to many of the other machines that this level, it's about 40% faster. Here's an example of the machine running at its top speed. And I'll make sure to leave the settings on the screen so you can see. Now let me be clear, this is the engraving speed. Depending on the materials that you're using, your cutting speed is gonna vary, which is very different than the engraving speed. You've seen other desktop CO2 machines with glass tubes out there, ranging from 30 watts to 60 watts. A CO2 glass tube is usually used between 10 and 90% of the power range of the advertised power, because the settings below 10% give you less than accurate results, and sometimes no results at all. An RF laser can be used between 2 and 99% of its power range, allowing you to use it on more delicate materials. That said, this laser is a 30 watt laser tube, but before you start typing in the comments that's not enough power, stick around and I'll show you some of the results of the power capability. The 30 watt RF tube is comparable to a 60 watt glass tube. So with this machine, you're essentially getting a 60 watt comparable laser that will require less maintenance and will last longer. The Glowforge Pro, which is in the same price range, only about a 45 watt machine, and similar lasers like the Xtool P2 and Ohmtech Polar are between 50 and 55 watts. The work area for this laser is 20 by 12 in 4.3 inches in height and has a max part size of 21.9 by 14 by 4.3 inches high. There is this front pass-through section, so you could theoretically have a longer piece, but to be honest, it's really not super practical to use as an engraving pass-through. There are no side pass-throughs because the machine houses electronics on both sides of the machine in these locked compartments. The overall size of the laser is roughly 36 inches by 27 inches by 18 inches tall. The machine weighs 170 pounds, but I honestly don't see you moving this around the shop. This machine, as you can see, is very durable. It's made with industrial grade metal that is designed to last. The company behind this laser is based in Texas, like me. So if you need any technical assistance, it's nice to be in the same time zone plus or minus a couple of hours. That's more than can be said about many of the other laser brands out there, but I suppose if you're working on lasers at night, having a company that's just waking up when you're getting ready to work could be a good thing. Although Thunder is based in Texas, you'll notice that some of the packaging and supplemental material is in broken English, 
which tells you where many of the parts and equipment come from. But Thunder does stand behind their product and even though many of the parts and equipment seem to be sourced from overseas, you're still gonna get a representative here in Texas or in the US. With the laser, you'll get a two year warranty and setting up a tech call is really simple. When my machine first arrived, I had an issue with the laser beam uh, when it wouldn't fire right away. Within a few minutes of connecting with Brian at Thunder, we determined that a wire came loose in shipping and removing and plugging it back in, I was able to do my first test firing. I mentioned a little bit ago about the touch screen and how it's super easy to navigate through. Let's quickly walk through some of the functions of the touch screen. I'm not gonna cover all of it because you can look through the user manual, which I'll post in the video description. So this will be quick. Across the top, you'll see a home screen, which will tell you the current status of your machine, whether you're running a job or not. On the manual page, you can jog the machine around using the touch screen instead of using the buttons located below the screen. This is also where you'll get control of the machine speed and distance of movements for jogging. The Bolt has built-in memory capacity, which can store multiple files up to one gigabyte, which is awesome because if you have jobs that you use frequently, you can just go straight to the files section and you don't have to worry about using your computer. This is a really nice addition to those doing repeated jobs like tumblers. This next screen is one that you'll use right away when you get the machine set up. The menu screen is where you can set the alignment of your laser and do a test fire. Like I mentioned earlier, when I would push the test fire after unboxing the unit, this is the screen that I was using. Once the wire was reconnected after shipping, I was able to pulse the laser options from this screen. You can either focus the laser manually or use the autofocus, which I found very accurate and quick. If you wanna focus manually, Thunder provides this focusing tool that you can place on the front of your laser head and adjust the Z height manually until it touches the work surface. Real quick before I move on to the next topic, since I'm right here at the laser head, you may be wondering what this knob is on the top of the gantry. This is the air assist control. If you're cutting material, you'll want this train up pretty high, but if you're doing engraving and just want a little airflow, you can adjust this down to clear the debris from your engraving. If you set off the heat alarm, you can turn this up next time to help the airflow on the work surface. The last two buttons to mention are the origin and frame buttons. The name should pretty much be self-explanatory, but you use the origin button to set the origin of your laser before starting the job, unless you're using absolute coordinates. And use the frame button if you want to see the area that will be engraved. There is another way that you can make sure that your engraving is in the right area as well. The Thunderbolt has an integrated high resolution camera that can give you real time preview of your working area. The camera is a five megapixel camera that connects via USB. You can see the work area here in Lightburn and you can calibrate the camera, but I'm not gonna do that in this video. Don't be alarmed when you see a fish eye view because once you update the overlay, everything will look normal and you can start framing out your workpiece. In the back of the machine, you'll see a direct drive fan with a variable speed controller. The exhaust fan is bolted onto the machine so you won't hear a lot of vibration and it comes with this four inch duct hose that you can run outside of your work area. It has a 215 CFM airflow and it's fairly quiet compared to other exhaust fans that I've used. Some materials can emit toxic fumes in the air so you should be exhausting the smoke from your work area. Of course, you'll wanna make sure that whatever materials you are working on, uh, cutting or engraving are laser safe. Here's a list of materials that you can cut with this machine. And here's a list of materials that can be engraved with the bolt. You can engrave wood, acrylic, leather, glass, tumblers, MDF, rubber, plastics, atomized aluminum. Uh, there's, there's tons of options. You can add the optional rotary so you can do round objects. A favorite type of engraving for turning a quick profit is engraving tumblers. You can remove the honeycomb bed and install the rotary by plugging it into this port right here. This roto boss has a few brackets that are attached parallel to the gantry, which is super nice. Then you'll need to set up the dimensions for your tumbler in the software and adjust your settings for whatever type of material you're engraving. There's a few extra steps that you'll need to take if using the rotary, like enabling the A access and then there's these additional buttons that come into the play on the controls. 
either down here or in the touchscreen panel. I'm not gonna be doing a full walkthrough of the rotary function, but if that's something that you'd like me to cover on this channel, let me know in the comments. All in all, this is a great laser, and the RF is a really cool laser to get to test. Be sure to come back and see my comparison on how this laser stacks up compared to some of the other brands that I've tested. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.